Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dana Miller. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at the Fisheries Center. Unfortunately, Anna couldn't be here today, so she's asked me to introduce our next speaker for the Fish 500 um, seminar series. So I am honored today to introduce our next speaker, our very own um, Dr. Rashid Smila. Um, he's the director of the, fish, uh, sorry, the Fisheries Economics Research Unit here at the Fisheries Center. And I'm sure um, many of you are, are uh, probably uh, quite um, familiar with his research. He specializes in bioeconomics, marine ecosystem valuation, and the analysis of global issues such as fisheries subsidies, illegal fishing, climate change, and oil spills. Smila is widely published with over 160 articles in peer-reviewed journals including Science, Nature, and the Journal of Environmental Economics and Management. Smila has won a number of awards such as the American Fishery Society 2013 Excellence in Public Outreach Award, the Leopold Leadership Fellowship in the and the Pew Fellowship for Marine Conservation. And today, Rashid will be talking to us about some research that has, of his, has, that has just recently been published um, though it's an idea that I believe he's been talking about and thinking about for quite some time now. So I'll leave it at that. If you could all um, join me in welcoming Dr. Rashid. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Dana, for introducing me. And like Dana said, this is, uh, I'll be talking about results from a paper that we just got published. And there are many co authors in the room, I'll show you the list. Data is one of them. <laughs> so, so, and, and so that's the title. And conservation economics, uh, many of you will be wondering what the hell am I talking? So I'll try to explain that. We go on. So this is the outline. I start off by laying the ground foundation. I'll talk about how the study came about. A little bit of history and the evolution of the idea. And then I talk about conservation economics and define it. Then, because this is linked to food security, I will then talk a little bit about what is meant by food security in general. So that then after that I go into the meat of the presentation, which is crossing the high seas. So this is our ocean. That's, uh, the blue areas are the exclusive economic zones. Uh, areas 200 nautical miles away from the coast as defined by the United Nations on coast. You have the law of the sea. Two, most countries approve that. Even those who did it actually go by that definition. In the US, for example. <laughs> it is a light, light, light blue area. And the area we'll be talking about today is the high sea. And these are the dark blue areas. As the largest part of the ocean, about who knows how much is it? What is the size of the high sea compared to the whole ocean? 50, 60, 60, 58, 60 percent. There you go. So that's larger than the EEZ. And that's something to watch as I go through, right? And the thing that got me into thinking about this is if you look at global catches, 80 million tons is an estimate people use about from FAO data. About 10 to 12 percent, 15 percent come from the high seas. Okay, so you have 80 percent plus, 8 to 5 coming from the EEZ. So I started thinking about this in 2005, actually, just coming from the economics. Here you are. You have an area. You get 90 percent of the catch close to shore. You know, 90 percent of close to shore, right? And the area is less than half of the whole ocean. And we get 10%, 12% from this larger area. Thinking of the economics, this seems to me, you start thinking, is it a sensible thing to do? How much more effort do you need to catch a ton of fish in the high seas versus the heat? So from the economics, I started wondering, if I own the ocean, will I really fish in the high seas? Think of burning of carbon. You have to travel far. You have to search for more fish in the lens dense area. So that was what started me in this direction. And I remember I, I raised this in the group that I was there he to talk. Don't even try. This is so unreasonable. It will go anywhere, right? I mean, close in the high seas. Who will support that? So actually, that kind of slowed this idea a bit. But I still wouldn't give up. So I, I did this paper together with the co-authors there. 
Well, what I did was simply to say, what, what would we lose if we were to close the high seas? So this is just a preliminary idea. Just went in there, look at the catches, shut down, zero catches from the high seas. What will the world lose? And so, catches, the losses, in terms of the revenues, and in terms of the dollars. And in the paper, I kind of waved hands and with my colleagues, and we said, okay, it seems like we wouldn't lose much if we did this. And then the idea went quiet, right? It went quiet, we didn't do anything about it. Then a few years back, the Global Ocean Commission was set up. This is a commission made up of really high ranking political <coughs> and financial banking leaders. Paul Martin is one of them, former Prime Minister of Canada. You have David Miliband, former Foreign Secretary of the UK. I have Emmanuel Trebomano, Tre who was Mandela's first finance minister. So this is a caliber of people, about 16 of them, spread all over the world. There is this Nigerian <coughs> lady, uh, Obia, who is on the panel. She was one of those who started Transparency International Corruption Index. She was one of the co-founders. So these are the people. And they asked me to kind of support them in terms of looking at economics. So 2003, there was the first meeting of the commission in South Africa, Cape Town, asked me to come. And they kept saying, you know, we must to do something bold about it, protecting the high seas. So I went up there and I told them, you really mean what you say? They shut down the high seas. And half of them thought I was crazy. And there's this from an uh, Australian foreign minister, he's on the panel. At dinner, he came to me and said, okay, Rashid, we had your craziest idea today. What would be the, cra the next crazy idea tomorrow? So this was the reaction I got. <laughs> but some of them liked it, like the former Prime Minister of Costa Rica, Jose Maria. He just loved this idea. So, so they, some liked it and so And it kept going on. So this report we did for them, actually. And in there, there was preliminary analysis. And based on that, actually, one of their recommendations I will show you was based on our report. Then we just look at catch data. So, and this led into this paper, which just appeared. I presented it at the AAAS two weeks ago. Got a lot of press. Dana has been tracking, and I'm sure Dana will be happy to share the paper and some of the key news uh, interviews that came out of. So this is what I'm going to talk to you share some of these. And you see the co-authors. Quite many. Vicky, Dana, Louise. Oh, Reg is in Australia, those who don't know Reg. Dirk is here. William is here. Isabel from SFU. Alex Rogers, Oxford. Carlo Robbins, York University. Eric Sala, National Geographic. Called Daniel Pauli. I don't need to introduce you. So, what do I mean by conservation economics? You know, when you start your career, students listen, you're fishing around and trying to work out something. You get your PhD, you start your postdoc, you get an assistant professor. After 20 years of study, realizing what you've been trying to do all these years, you look back. And it seems to me more and more, this is my thing, conservation economics. And that means, I would like to look at ocean as a system. Thinking of the biology, the economics, the markets, is a system. You know, it's nice to understand how one fish behaves. That is great, but knowing about the whole system is very important. It has to be high scale, therefore, it's high scale, global, regional, national. It is an ecosystem one, and it has to be interdisciplinary. No biologist can solve this problem. No economist can do it. No. Got to get people together. So some of my students have lawyers, right? So it has to be interesting. And all this comes into, so you have to think of ocean health. You have to think of dollars. We all have to. At least you need it for your coffee, right? Dollars are important. And you have to think of the social side of things. And so that is what I classify as conservation relation to the oceans 
I just saw this quote from the president himself. And he says, focusing your life solely on making the bar shows a certain poverty of ambition. Isn't that beautiful? Well said. He said more. Than this is just about. So making an ocean just to sell us our dollars and our economies is a poverty of ambition. There are bigger things. You have to maintain the, the ecosystem. You have to think of who gets the money. So you have to think of the money, of course, but it shouldn't be solely. So that is my economic studies. Well, 20 years has led me to. Now, food security, what is that? Four elements then. Food has to be available for everybody, okay? Has to be accessible. Utilization. People have to have the ability to use the food. Sometimes you have the food and there's no water. You have to go to some villages in the developing world. Have your corn, water to boil the corn. So it has to be available. And stability is important. Even in times of crisis, this is from the UN. So when you think of food security, this is the general understanding. And there are issues here. Why? Because ecological foundation is important to our food system. And the ocean is one of them in addition to agriculture. And we know that we are, our actions are threatening these systems. We can argue how much, but I think everyone. Is there anyone who doesn't believe that? We are doing too much to our ocean and air systems. In this room, raise your hand. Nobody tangled. Indeed, you don't think so? Why not? Better, you're close to my office, be careful. This <laughs> <laughs> is just very, I mean, uh, it's fine. I just wanted to see. So, in general, most people believe that we need to do something to really keep our systems progressing. Now, let's get to the ocean. Linking to the point I made, inadequate management. The high seas are actually not completely free for all. We have RFMOs, and some of them are doing well, better than others. But in general, the management, many of us think it's not uh, being managed. Relative to the EEZs, and why, anyone who goes into Canadian waters without permission will see somebody check them, right? But the high seas are, there's no such money. So. Overfishing and population decline, people have shown that this is happening for at least some of the species out there. Bycatch is a problem, <coughs> habitat destruction, bottom trolling, and so on. So these are issues that people have talked about. This is some, that's for you. Most of them are looking down, a few looking, one looking up, some are stable. But in general, that is the kind of picture you see. For some of the species that we take out from the high sea, additional concerns, deep sea species, some of them long living, and so very vulnerable to fishing. Some live longer than people, right? As far as the biologist told, told me. So you, you need to fish them carefully. Or not at all, much of the deep ocean is actually not well understood here. So if you don't know something, most of us will say be careful. Careful what you do, because you don't understand the system. And many high sea fisheries will not be viable without government subsidies. And in this paper, we actually did a quick estimate of bottom trawling, high seas and the deep seas. And what we found is government subsidies to the vessels that go out was about 25% of the landed values, the revenues they make, 25%. And the profits, 10%. That tells you already, like, most of them will not be able to fish them without the money. Okay? That's the economic. So, some of you know Barbara Block, the tuna champion, and she has shown a lot of interaction between tuners in the EEZ and the high seas. I think that's one of our big points. So if you don't manage the high seas, well, even if you manage your EEZ, well, you may suffer negative consequences. Because you know what? The fish don't respect the orders we put. We put lines, the fish don't know that, right? It, it's our own demarcation administrative. And they don't need visa to get into anybody's waters, right? So, 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 so what? If you are sitting here, somebody messes there, you may be impacted because of the interactions. And that is one 
big oil in the family. So one of the first things we did was to take the total global catch and say, how much of this comes solely from the high seas? How much solely from EEZ? How much are from species that straddle between the two? Right? These are the numbers which we got in, a, in, an earlier, in an earlier analysis. What was shocking is that less than 0.4% of the species, according to our data and analysis, remember this is fact, not perfection. If you are in science, you are not in the business of perfection. These are estimates. Right? But less than 1.5% one, one actually of the species we could identify live only in the high system, according to the catch, where we catch them. Picture 42% are struggling. And when you think in terms of weight, 67%. In terms of money, 78% of the total land and value, almost 100 billion dollars, is actually fish species that do this. So, very big point. And it was on the strength of these numbers that the Global Ocean Commission actually came up with some suggestions. And I'll get to that. The other point we found was that. Ten top high species nations take away about 70% of the landed value. Right? This international water belongs to all of us. Ten countries appropriate 70%. So that quickly led me to think in my mind. The Pope is talking about inequality. The President is talking about inequality. Have you ever heard Hapa talk about inequality? I'm not sure. I haven't seen that. But I've, I've seen President Obama talking about inequality. And this could be one of the root causes, right? And this is serious, not because you have a good heart, because it's good for you, right, to really think of inequality. So one of the most enduring practical problems of human society, according to Pelta, is the issue of distribution. And Stiglitz, a well price winning economist, says inequality has great economic, political, and social consequences. So everybody should care about it, that's the point. Not because we love those being messed up by the system, but because it's actually good for you. So this then came into our analysis. So there are two points here. If you close the high seas, what will that do to catches and dollars? And what will that do to the distribution of the benefits from the high seas to countries, coastal countries of the world? Right? So whilst we're doing this, Chris Costello and his postdoc for White were also thinking about this. So they did a model which they published in 2013. A rough model, I think there were lots of criticism that they did it. <laughs> they came up with results, and the resources that actually would make more money by closing the high seas. This is beautiful. Once Somaila and Chris Costello say the same thing, usually people, people start to listen. Most of the time we <laughs> we go after each other. So, so that is nice. And then the, the Global Ocean Commission also came out with their report. And one of the things they had in there is that if the world, because it's a political group, they couldn't say close the high seas, and it was a big argument. In fact, I was surprised at the, uh, the, at, the, at the agreement they got. What they said is if in five years the world doesn't come up with a good management system for the high seas, then we should turn the high seas into high seas generation zone. I beautiful one. <laughs> so, uh, and if you look at our paper, we call this make the high seas the fish bank of the world, which is the same concept actually. So the fish can hide there, away from our big guns, our big boats for a while, <laughs> grow, spawn more, lay eggs, and then you know float through and hopefully have. So that is the global ocean. What did we do about this? We started asking questions now. If we actually close the high seas, what percentage increase in the catch of struggling taxa within EEZ will likely uh, make closing the high seas catch neutral? I was very interested in this because when you mentioned this, the first thing people complain about is we're going to lose big catches, right? So I said, how about we explore this? What percentage of the high seas? 
uh, strata increase. If we close the hyacinths, what percentage increase because of transfer and transferase in the EEZ? What percentage increase will make catch neutron? All right. So if you're taking 80 million tons, we still take 80 million tons because then you take away the food security argument. So we, we explore that. And then we compare this because Costello's paper, they had a range of things they ran and some uh, scenarios they did. So we compare that. So our point is if our catch neutral percentage is way out of the range, then this doesn't make sense in terms of food security. And if it is reasonably within the range, yeah, maybe. So that was the point there. And then we go into the politics, because if it is good for the world, how about is it good for you? Yeah. And so you have to go there. So we looked at which countries, political groupings and continents start to be lose, and then what are the distribution, the distribution I mentioned to you, how would I change? So. And then method, and this is where technically we can challenge it. This method is based upon specialization, and this is the Sierra Leone data, specializing the of FAO data, putting them in half degree by half degree. Okay, and based on that, determine the percentage increase in the catch of straddle in that wood. This is the question I posed. And then compare the, this was the range in White and Costello's paper. They did a, a sweep of 10 to 70%. Because we don't really know, I remember we are economists, right? I don't know about how fish move, but that's not my point. It's just to make a big point. And so we just sweep things within the range to see what is reasonable. Okay, so, and then we do the, the regional global and all that. And then we assess the distribution. And how many of you have heard about the Gini coefficient? As a, Key indicator used to measure inequality of income within countries or within groups. So we calculated that, and this was one of the conversations we were going home. Me and Daniel we started talking about this, and I said, maybe you should calculate the Gini coefficient, you know, to capture this. So we went ahead and it added a lot of value because most of the people, a lot of the people who are interested in this, are actually those who care about inequality in the world. And then 10 to 70, and actually the Barcelona paper, they were, they were closer to 42 was where they were there's of increase in straddling stock. So that gives you some benchmark, right? The rate was 10 to, 10, to, 10 to 70, and we found that if the increase is up to 80% of stocks that straddle, then you'll be catching it. Nice, 18%, which actually falls nicely closer to the 10% there, and well below the 42%. Give me some hope. Now it's for some biologists to prove this right or wrong. I'm waiting for you guys. Okay, so so that is uh, that is one point. And if you just take so if you take the 18% increase, which is about on the low side of things, this is a picture of the countries that will lose in red and those. Will again in blue, right? So most of the worst countries will be in the coastal ones I'm talking about. And then, of course, those who fish a lot will lose right? everything being equal. But that's a picture that we're seeing. Key points big countries actually will make money, and least developed countries will make money. You know, there is an issue there with island, Pacific island states who who will be losing money back. But you know, uh, the question is, who is actually losing money? Because they sign a lot of uh, flag of convenience, and I'll talk about that later. So, if you look at the 18%, four continents will be fine, two will lose, that's the 18%. But that's the, uh, the, 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 the not, not the best scenario. If you look at the 42% of Costello, actually, every continent will make money. And so your problem is within continents, those who will lose out to be. And there are all sorts of ways you can do that, right? You can even buy them off or pay them off or buy them, whatever. But that is for another analysis to look at. In theory, so you Now, the equity side. This is uh, 
This is a summary of the results. The Gini coefficient. Essentially, what the Gini coefficient tells you is if you take 1% of the population or whatever you're looking at, what percentage of the benefits do they get? So the 45 degree line tells you that 1% of the population get 1% of the income, 20%, 20%, 100%, 100%. So that's equal, really an equal society. There's no such society in the amazing. And then when we calculated for the current situation where 10 countries take 70%, this is what you get. And the area between the 45 degree line and the curve is your coefficient. So currently it's about 0.66, 66%. All right, which is really, if you look at countries, this is about the worst distribution we have in terms of countries, in terms of income. Does anybody know the country with the worst distribution of income in the world today? Huh? North Korea, no. The U.S. U.S., okay. Any other trials? Brazil. Huh? Brazil. Japan? Brazil. Dubai? Actually, no. It's amazing, huh? Brazil? Not Brazil. No. Mexico, Brazil. Russia. Okay, I should tell you. No. South Africa, okay? Oh. And you all know why. The history tells you. So it's South Africa, okay? 166. And then the best countries, about 0.33, that you can get for sure. Sweden, Norway, Denmark, so. so by doing this, you turn the world of high seas fishing into the world of South Africa, the world of Norway or Sweden. Which one do you like? <laughs> <laughs> so that is, uh, that is uh, a nice thing for us, I think. So this is just a summary, and uh, I'm, I'm looking at time. We should get time to discuss. But essentially, at the 42, like I showed you, all continents, Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll make more catches, more money, 60%, 50%, all continents fine. US, China, and Japan will actually be on the plus side. EU members, so it's really looking good if this uh, is proven to be right. And this is just the beginning of the cost of analysis. And then Taiwan and South Korea will lose on every scenario. So these are countries that the world will have to find a way to get them. So, discussion and conclusion. Conservation economics. This economics that is environmentally sensitive. Sensitive to the economics. And also should say it's sensitive. And it seems that if you close the high sea, you'll be able to improve all of this. Our problem will be how to get those who currently are gaining to agree to it. Our findings also suggest that closing the high seas is unlikely to lead to risk food security through reduction in touches and incomes. It's more likely that those in the high seas will enhance this. Okay, so this is just the tip of the iceberg. As I said, we do this big idea things, you throw them out and the work just begins. It's a lot to be done here. And these are already initiatives within this house that are ongoing. I told you that island states seem to be doing badly. And our suspicion is that because a lot of them sign flag of convenience agreements with countries. So the question is who is actually losing? Is this Samoa or any other of those countries that's losing? Or is it the, the flag, the, 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 the owner of the flag, right, that they sold to them? And, and Dana is looking into that now. Then there's the question of, uh, so far we haven't included cost at all. So Rebecca somewhere here, about to start looking at the cost of fishing and how that plays out. Uh, and Louise, Louise likes socioeconomics a lot, and she loves her community fishes, small-scale fishes. So the question she'll be looking at is, what will be the impact to people in small communities? And of course, William is the pushing the climate story. What does this mean, climate change? Add more receipts or not? Will the distribution of benefits change? How? Ah, so that is that. And I think at this point, I will just thank all of you for being so patient to get this story. Now it's your turn to go after me. Here. <laughs> and my co authors are here so they can help me out.
Go ahead, you. So, so uh, I agree with the idea that the closing high seas will make the enforcement and monitoring easier, or to make it straightforward. But I don't know if uh, closing the high seas and making some of the striding stuff, shared stuff, uh, address the, the core issue of shared stuff, which is the, the strategic interaction between countries that leads to, to prisoners and drama kind of outcome, where it's better for individually to just hammer the stuff down and then everybody else worry about conservation. So I don't know how, like, how would that change? Uh, change, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a, a good question. I got something similar in a radio interview uh, about, you know, somebody said, but in the different forms. We know that some of the countries really do a bad job of managing their needs. The man you're telling them to manage, you know, what does that mean? So that's, you know. and what I said then is, this story, this proposal, is not I'm going to solve all our problems. In fact, it has to be combined with many other measures. And one of them is to improve management of the needs. That's a big issue, right? Far from perfect. Yeah. So, so that's one point. Strategically, getting to your strategy, I think that you remember the saying when they say that necessity is the mother of invention, right? <laughs> so, my strategically, I think if you close up the high sea, and all that countries can do is to fish within their waters, the incentive to manage their waters better. Wow. Even for the shared soil? Yeah, even, even for the shared soil, they will have to negotiate. That is a bit more complicated. But, but in general, right, if you don't have options, <laughs> then you take what you have much better than if like, Japan can just move to West Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, these are all speculations. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, let's go. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, fun to debate. Uh, so it's, I, I take it it's really academic, so it's open for debate. Oh, and, beautiful. Let's yeah. go. And, uh, so you're an economist. Yes. Uh, you look at biology and ecology, but uh, you've got to consider the ecology and biology of one of these creatures because uh, there are things sustainable yields to be had by a lot of by tuna species. If you want to eat our sushi, you like to have albacore, big eye, yellow, dolphin tuna, sushi, basically, is cut and, and bluefin. A lot of these species uh, uh, basically are easily caught offshore. Uh, the big sustainable yields to be had, you know, perhaps easier to catch offshore. And the um, spawning grounds and nursery grounds are actually um, near shore inside the EZs. So if you basically said, oh, you've got to catch these species near shore, uh, basically limiting the fishing to their spawning grounds and the nursery areas, which you really don't want to do for a lot. And there are proposals to close um, areas. It's kind of, it may not be very successful. It just be effort in an inappropriate way. But so there are a lot of issues that this would really fail on in terms of yield per group and uh, catching fish that are, like, let's say, preferable for the market in terms of size and, and, and quality. You don't want to be catching uh, females. And, and so this proposal flies in the face of, of fish ecology uh, for a lot, of, a lot of the major species that we catch offshore. Very good. Very good. I mean, you want to follow on that? You want to answer it for me? Or? <laughs> well, just, Go ahead. Just, Go. I don't want to sound like I'm in corner in this, though. But but there's a general point here that you just said there's only one and a half percent of these stocks are dedicated to the high seas. You use that to justify, on the one hand, that this is a good thing because we have access to that beauty And then, on the other hand, you, you come up with some idea that there are going to be some protection there. So, so that doesn't make sense to me. Really? Then you, really? Start, then, you start to, then you start to list some of the other negatives that could happen. Like, you could be forcing more fishing into. Yeah, these nearshore areas where there are traditionally higher buying catch rates, mm -hmm. higher um, problems with interaction with other species, yeah, yeah. things like that. Yeah. And then you accept that the way that it's distributed now fishing is because they're trying to maximize profit. So for whatever reason, they're out there on the high seas right now. So if you are restricting them to this arbitrary, certainly ecologically biologically arbitrary line, you're costing people something. So I guess my question, following up from what Verlock said about problems with ecology, the fact that I can think of so many doubts I've got over whether or not this seems like a reasonable proposal. If do you accept those doubts? And if you do, no, no, it, I mean, yeah. But that, <laughs> just, <laughs> look, just imagine there's a hundred thousand people yeah. who are going to be a little bit less well off and a little bit less food. How, with the weight of that consequence, and given what I think are a series of very reasonable doubts. Like how do you defend it? Like how do you no, no, see here, okay. I, I, I try to take both of them. 
this is something I expect, right? <laughs> you know, you throw out this idea and then you get reactions. What do you need to do, brother? Especially with the ecology, I told you, I'm, I'm always sweeping scenarios and I, I have co-authors here that will answer more closely to the, to the ecology. What do you do when we you throw out this ideas is to force people to work harder and actually prove it or not prove it. So you have to do some work, you and your colleagues on the ecology, and we'll see what happens is out there. Can be proven wrong, all right, but that's that. And you, what were you saying? I don't even get, get what you're I'm saying. Huge, I think there's Actually, what we serious, almost certain consequence, of at least in the short term, and that just, that means the weight of evidence has to be strong, surely. Obviously, obviously. This is just the tip of the iceberg, okay? We're going to really explore this, and I'm sure people are going to explore this. And you don't just run off and implement, right? Uh, an idea like this, it takes time to work through. Daniel, you wanted to come in. Yeah, two things. First of all, um, on the, the, the species that uh, can be profitably exploited or in terms of yield per crew only if they are in the high seas. That would have to be demonstrated that it is the case for every species. For, you mentioned blue, bluefin. Uh, it has been exploited for centuries, for millennia, bluefin, uh, by uh, traps, traps that are attached to land uh, in the Mediterranean. And uh, that was uh, sustainable fisheries. It was not in the high sea fisheries. And they were fishing adults. The same thing would apply to Western, uh, 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 to the Western stock of uh, of, um, of bluefin that is uh, has been traditionally exploited by harpoons off of the coast of Canada. So you you would have to demonstrate this objection that they can be profitably and and adequately in terms of yield per crude, for example, exploited only offshore. And the se the, the second point is. Obviously, even if we are very optimistic about the politics of it, and we have no reason to be really optimistic about anything of it like that, this would never be implemented en bloc, but it would be in, 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 in implemented area by area. For example, this could be a justification for closing various don donut holes that exist uh, in the Pacific, and, and closing donut holes because the donut hole have traditionally caused immense problems, and uh, the UN uh, is dealing with it. This is halfway solved in the South Pacific, but uh, I see also other areas around the Orkney Island, which have in, uh, in Antarctica, which have no EZ. This could be a justification for doing it. This this will never pass, uh, for example, the, the UN General Assembly, yeah. or it, maybe all, 50 yeah. years. But, but it can provide the internal, the, the framework for partial and local solution. In fact, in I have an example on that. Uh, when I presented this in South Africa, there was a Russian, high-ranking Russian official on the panel. And he didn't like this at all. He, he kicked at me like crazy. And I always because it's part of the panel. Nobody has kicked at you before you haven't done anything, guys, okay? Remember that. So this guy, the next time we met, you know why he came to me and said, maybe, maybe your thing has made me to start thinking. Maybe we should close all the areas where the RFMOs are not acting. Yes, move. Yes, move. So that is also an important point. And, and, and Tom, just a minute. The thing is, you're assuming that by doing this, people, a lot of people will lose. You don't have any evidence. In fact, what we're no, saying no, is that saying, people make I'm saying, gain, I'm saying right? That, so that's... I'm saying that we know in the short term they will. Yeah, because short they term, of course. Because they're in a certain way, yeah. you're arbitrarily yeah, yeah. something else. Yeah, yeah. So we'll do more steps. Because if you feel subsidies, mm -hmm. you wouldn't just get to this. Wouldn't you have to just forget this sure. arbitrary lines? What, what, what about your, your great suggestion to reduce the fuel subsidy, which might have this effect anyway? You know what? That is also on the table. <laughs> that is on the, I'm not taking that off the table. We haven't even been able to do that, you know. Anyway, let's get somebody on. Rashid, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious. Um, I very much like what Daniel said, and it's very true. Locally, um, uh, the closure would work, and, and, and potentially temporary too. But what you're suggesting here is, is a global. I, I, just, I just wonder why you need it to do as a global scale. Mm -hmm. I understand this is something you're passionate about. Yeah. And particularly for international community, last month 
we have just B, B, and J start passing through, <laughs> and 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 the process has just started, and the next year is fish stock agreement review. So there's two big projects coming up for Pateri Strong and fish stock, and this I just wonder if this sort of proposal, I mean I know you're not talking <laughs> about, would it actually slow the negotiation down. I understand for the BBNJ, there are countries who doesn't really want to talk about fisheries in that process. I understand for the fish stock, they don't really talk so much about ecosystem-based management, yet, yet both sides really want to push it. Yeah. And, and, and in this kind of like a very grandiose kind of idea, do you think it would inspire them or would it be more discredited, particularly, if I may say, GOC it's not a bunch of scientists supporting. It's politicians. And I just wonder what their agenda is. I mean, particularly, I met one of the British coming from Japan. She knew nothing yeah. about ocean. Yeah, but that was yeah. also on purpose. Scientists, mm. have, uh, scientists have been talking all sorts of things that nobody listened to. So that was, that was uh, to, to use heavy duty political and business people. So that's mm. another strategy. It's just another strategy, right? Mm. Uh, and they are supported by scientists, right? They, mm. they, I, I, or Martin will come to me and uh, don't tell him this. I know I'm being recorded. Say, Rashid, can I say this? Can I say that? You go and ask the ecologist. So they are aware that they are not fisheries scientists. They get that part. Just like they run your countries. Your, your prime minister, I don't think. So that's that's the purpose. Yeah, yeah. So that's the purpose of this. I, I just yeah, hear yeah. without and, knowing and any of the context, they just take the idea and and, and they come with it. That's okay. what I'm so, hearing about. But that's one point. Your second point was was what whether this will help the would processes it, it help in the, the U.S. I I really world. don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But my feeling is that it could actually push some of the countries at least. Mm. It could because and and there are two ways. You know, I've given talks about this at the UN, three, three groups. Mm -hmm. Africa groups, they love it. Caribbean groups, they love it. Mm. And Pacific Island groups, they love it. Because they can't go there to fish. So that's already about 77 countries or more. Mm. They, 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 they love this. So you could see some people pushing for it. And those who don't want to do something may also be pushed back. Because they see the threat. If they don't fix it, the world may decide. And this is. This is outside the scope of a politician. If enough of the world's population want this, we get it, okay, Tom? Yeah, if they want it, and we can just convince them by evidence. And if you have a counter, please write your papers, Tom. That is the way you do it. This is academic work. Get out there with your ideas, and we'll see. Because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a market for ideas, right? So, yes. This, this so, was the same thing with the EZ. Yeah. If, we, if we try to to think of ourselves in the, in the 50s. In the 50s, a few countries, Iceland, yeah. uh, Peru, uh, claimed a patriotic sea. The, the Peru called it patriotic sea. This was completely absurd to the US fishing interests at the time for tuna. And they, they dismissed it. And the British fought a war over Iceland, uh, Iceland uh, extending the, the jurisdiction. But at the same time, there were countries that saw the, the, the writing on the wall. Germany did not participate in that war. They had uh, other things to sort out at the time. And, uh, and, uh, and Britain had to swallow the extension. Japan had to swallow the extension. Japan lost access to lots of, of waters that it, it, it seemed to depend on. And it was, if you look at, if you read papers from the 50s, the, 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 the imagination that, the imagining that 200 miles would be closed, no, was total science fiction. Completely. In fact, there was a big fight to extend yes. three miles, the territorial sea from three miles to 12 miles. And it was a huge fight. And, oh and it was done. And uh, by consensus, even the US could not disagree. But, and then they realized that they, have to, that they benefit from, yeah, yeah, yeah. from it. And as, when they suddenly realized that they benefit from it, boop, they, they swung around. <laughs> and Japan had to swallow that they didn't have access to uh, uh, to people's waters, okay. and and I think the same thing could happen here. Oh yeah, no, it could happen overnight, Tom. Before you wake up, <laughs> you know, this is the world. The world moves by ideas. Who else wants to talk? I see your uh, answer. You know, you can go up. Please go ahead. Uh, 
Uh, it's totally inappropriate, isn't it, to compare equality of individuals, that metric, the Gini coefficient, if individuals in a country to equality amongst countries which have different regional resource access. I mean, you wouldn't say we need equality in your coffee production. Like people, oh, people say. Okay, but, but <laughs> I mean, this is going to be a problem in Scotland, okay, I'm just saying. All right, Scotland, we'll become joint and do that one fine. Due to the way oh. that um, the countries have existed yeah. and the resources that they have, their economies are based on things like high seas fishing. That's not, it's not unfair to other people. You can't treat it like you treat equality of opportunity for individuals in the country. I, I was, just can't believe according, that. According, that's appropriate. Wait, according to Tom, okay? okay. According to Tom. According to Tom. Yeah, right? that, that's, that's it. And that's all right. <laughs> hey, you don't want to talk? You shouldn't be Tom at all. Oh, no, Daniel. I, I want the discussion. Right? But a follow-up to, 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 to what you were saying, there was something that came to my mind. It will come back. A very good example of what you were saying about the impossible suddenly becoming impossible. It's almost always impossible until it happens, right? You guys know the history of the world, right? So this is where we are, some of us. Please, please. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I guess it's seems like one of the major arguments in favor here is that poor management of the of the, I see. Of the, the ocean commons <coughs> is uh, will be fixed by, by removing opportunities there and concentrating all the opportunities in the individual countries, in the individual uh, international countries. Now it seems very similar to like the ITQ type arguments mm -hmm. that, that that we've seen, you know, in different situations in different countries and. We haven't really been happy with a lot of the outcomes when we move to this ITQ war. Or, or, or how, how do we expect different outcomes when we move to individual countries controlling chunks of, of stocks or chunks of, of fish resource without that, that common it's still there? I don't know. It's just, it strikes me that. So you mean by closing the high seas in a way that is meant or close to ITQs? I don't, I don't see the connection there. Well, cur currently the, the high seas are like an open access fishery, right? Okay. Your, your, your intention is to remove the open access fishery. All fishing will now be done within EZ and they're all controlled by states. We get a lot of, you know, when we commodify fish stocks from open access to individual controlled quotas, we got a lot of un undesirable outcomes. So, uh, I, I see a parallel here, and I'm they? wondering if, if I'm just crazy. Yeah, it crazy. seems so. Different countries. We're saying we want to remove this global. Open oh, like, so this global or these regional. So Mike, you are not happy with their outcomes, but it, it feels awfully naive. So are their you from, from a so are you advocating open access all over or what? You know, is that why you want? No, no. I mean, you, okay, I mean, no, he doesn't want open access. So we can't go. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he's saying about consistency. So yeah. if if at the moment there is our FMO and, and there is a consistency agreement which whatever our FMO put as a fishery uh, management and, and, and the state has to follow. But if if we just shut down uh, 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 actually, at all, we have nothing to keep the consistency with, which actually may weaken um, state management. So state could uh, anything, whatever they like to do, but in, within their EZ, because there's there's nothing they have to follow with. High sea is completely shut down. But at the moment, fish stock agreement, be able to something, all that sort of things. You start considering about new and exploratory fisheries. You know, those things which developing in, in, in the high seas, it's not doing great, I agree with you. Okay, all right. But whether we have some standard somewhere or not at all, is, is, is I thought maybe that something might. So, so if we keep the RFMOs and close where RFMOs are not active, will you be happy? 
I'm negotiating with him now. I think the same is case, even if you go to high seas, yeah. you'll still need IPTC or WTC PSC to allocate the catch of tuna quota between countries because maybe. why? Maybe. Why? Why? Because because those why? fish are still off the And huh? therefore any shared stock. And so the, the the negotiation has to be done. And so the AIPC, you know, I mean we Either ice is being closed or open, we are still need to face the out of the before we can really? any kind of uh, improvement. Yes, uh, okay, that's a comment. So basically what you're saying is that all of the fish that are within a economic exclusion zone are owned by the state that controls the economic the exclusion. Yes. And that any fish that swim across EEZs and the high seas are only owned when they're in the EEZ of a particular country. Yes, that's true. So going back to the ITQ thing, you're essentially saying that each state has an individual qu quota that is yeah, perhaps not is transferable, but is an in uh, quota yeah. essentially based on when the fish are actually in their waters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that is actually the power of the proposal. Because then you have the country on the, you remember in 1995, right? Captain Canada, you know? Mm -hmm. Everybody was born in 1995. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday I gave, a, I gave a lecture at the public school here, yeah, Prince of Wales. And I said, oh, in 1995 there were issues in you know, Spain and Canada, right? You remember? And then I suddenly realized this is a high school. So I said, well, were you, uh, is there anyone here who was not born in 1995? And actually, they were all not born. <laughs> yeah, so 1995, you remember the, the, the fight where, where the Canada, huh? Tobin Bryan, he nearly became prime minister because of this. Old sitting at the outskirts, just grabbing court according to the story. I wasn't there. So, so that's the, the, the kind of thing you, you will solve. You don't catch it to one day out there because it's for everybody. But when they come to your waters, property and that is a channel to which we hope this will lead to better management, more catches, more equity. But you are the you you can catch all of the fish that into your water. Okay, that is another issue. No 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 I don't know of any country that is that crazy to say my policy my policy is to empty the ocean. Most of them say it's sustainability. <laughs> they might have problems they are not able to implement that's another problem. So I think we have to wrap that up. Very good. Wrap up.